Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived to let me spend more time than I'd ever get on the radio with interesting people. Um, Paul Sinha, welcome. Lovely to be here, thanks. It's lovely to see a comedian, broadcaster, professional quizzer, former doctor, um, a couple of quotes that you have used to describe yourself, the only openly gay British Asian qualified doctor and TV quizzer on the UK comedy circuit, and now uh, writer, me memoirist. Memoirist is a nice great, word, isn't it? Yeah. Great title. Once in her lifetime. Once in Everybody her loves the title. A great title. The story of how a relatively dull and studious Asian kid who was pushed into a career in medicine ended up as a professional stand-up comedian and quizzer. That's pretty much it, yes. And it does exactly what it's... And also, of course, former star panellist on, on a much-missed uh, panel show, performed above a pub in South East London called yeah. No Pressure to Be Funny, presented by that gobby twat off LBC. I think you're talking about yourself, and and I usually and, too. And, unless, unless Al Berry's got a job on <laughs> LBC. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, that. It was the Hob, wasn't it? In yeah, Forest Hill. It's yeah. a long, long time ago. Commonwealth Games, 2010. That's right. Yes, well so done. That's what my monologue was about. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly. Good <laughs> lord. Um, and it is uh, to that memory that we will return a little a little later in the program. But we begin in 1970. Born in Luton, moved to Norwich. Before you can remember. Yeah, imagine. no, mem no memories here at all. But my dad was. Uh, a travelling doctor, just going from place to place, depending on where work took him. Uh, from a family of medics, the latest in a long line of medics, longish line. Yes. My, my dad's dad was a sort of legendary GP in Calcutta. And it was actually after I'd started writing the book that uh, my dad just let slip that his dad had looked after Mahatma Gandhi during his famous fast in Calcutta in the late 1940s. And I'm like, you've chosen to tell me this now. <laughs> After all these years. But my dad's very good at that, of holding on to bits of information that he doesn't necessarily think I need to know. Did he think he had told you? Or did he know that he kept it from you? No, I think he thought he told me. Right. He'd assumed. Yes. You would, wouldn't you? Well, we we, we went to quiet. see the film Gandhi together in January eighty three and <laughs> my dad was say my dad was like saying we we were there, we were there, we were there, but never went into any details. Right. Uh, never told me that his own dad was one of his doctors. Um so it's South London is where the memories begin i think yeah uh we moved to wimbledon in, in 73 or 74 and i remember seeing the wombles on the telly that's my first recollection of something on the telly that i can remember now uh, we lived in a flat in, in a block of flats very close to the tennis mm. and oddly enough a couple of years ago i found myself on that road accidentally my husband oliver was driving us to a, a quiz we found ourselves, and I looked up and I saw the block of flats. And the first thing to say is your perception is so difficult, yeah. different, because as a kid, everything's massive. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and so it looked tiny in comparison now. But secondly, I just burst into tears. It was just one of those things where you, suddenly the, all the memories just come flooding back. You just don't expect to be presented with your, with your childhood all of a sudden without, without any kind no. of warning, just like that. And I just burst into tears in the passenger seat. It's weird. Happy to. Happy to, yeah. yeah. Overwhelmed, I guess. And just almost Overwhelmed as if you've by been... the fl a flood of memories that just have, haven't been poked at. Or you've been ambushed by your younger self, in yeah. a way. Well, I suppose. the younger building as much as anything else. Yeah. <laughs> that's my recollections of the block of flats. Um, primary school, we'll begin with. Or we'll begin with home life. Do you, do you, with siblings? I mean, did, did, was dad around a lot or was he usually at the hospital? Or, or... My dad was around a lot by which i mean he didn't do on calls right um and so he although he worked very very hard we knew he'd be back by six seven o'clock so there, was, there wasn't an there wasn't any unexpected drama to his work work lifestyle uh very tight-knit family continue to be a tight-knit family just the one sibling my sister lily but we we remain as tight-knit as you can imagine as very much illustrated in the book yes and, and so happy childhood then yes um I, this is not a this is not a trauma memoir. This is not Angela's ashes. Um, <laughs> I, I had a very pampered, cosy, suburban, quiet, slightly friendless until I was about thirteen, fourteen years old. I was I was a bit of a loner. Uh, didn't find it necessarily easy to make friends because I was naturally shy hmm. uh, and not especially gregarious, but also. Very, very, very sort of conditioned to think in what we what we call nerdish, um, geeky ways. I was very much somebody who was gifted academically, but didn't really know what this meant. Or I was just. How, how did you know? When did you first 
discover that you were gifted academically? I was put up a year. Right. That's a uh, bit of a giveaway, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I was put up a year when I was about five or six years old. Right. Uh, at the lunch break, the teachers arrived in the playground and said, there's Paul Sinha here. And I put my hand up and they said, you're moving up a year. Uh, and as it turned out, that was very much what I needed at the time because I was something of a trouble, troublesome kid. I was a, I Because was you were bored? Bored, yeah. yeah. I, was, I, I don't remember any of this, but I was seen and reliably informed by child psychologists, child psychiatrists, by my parents wanting to know why I was behaving so badly. Well, what were you doing? I, when you say trial, I wasn't expecting it to have reached that level of... Causing fights. Really? Breaking things, hitting people. Just generally bored and objectionable. Well, we've all been bored. It doesn't yeah. necessarily be bored, cast bored and objectionable. And, and really, at such moment. an early age. Yeah, at such weird. a young age. But it disappeared almost in- instantly. Once you'd gone up and yeah. you actually got engaged in the lessons. Yeah. Can't have helped, though, with the socialising side of things to be much younger than your peers, measurably younger than your classmates. Well, this is a time that I don't especially remember very well, other right. than the academic high flying. I remember at the end of every year, with an almost bored tone, the teachers would say, and top of the class is Paul Sinha again. And I, I remember this being sort of a, a repeated trope in my early years. <laughs> and I don't, my, my mum seems to think it happened quite accidentally, that they might have turned up at the wrong school by mistake. But I ended up going to one of South London's most prestigious prep schools called Dulwich, I think it's called Dulwich Prep now. Yes. But it was called Dulwich College Prep then. Uh, it was, an academic hothouse but my mum rather tells it that they they just turned up at the wrong they they turned up they thought they were going to Dulwich College to have a look at it and they turned up at the wrong school and were greeted by the headmaster saying who are you and they, they explained who they were and the headmaster took me for a chat and was so impressed with me that they offered me a place then and it's a very unusual ch- ho- very un- this is these are the ages of eight to thirteen. Yeah, this is a very unusually driven academic hothouse. They okay. produce scholarship students all over, you know, all over the place, uh, and incredibly conservative. Right. I think things have changed a lot now. I, I feel anecdotally from what I've heard from other people, but this is very much grooming people to be Tories. Mm. This was a this was a well, it's not an unfamiliar era because of the, what's happening with the VAT now and, and the, the current Labour government. But it was very much at the time seeing that the Labour Party were were spawn of Satan. Yes, because it was seen that they were they were going to close down all the private schools. That was the belief, and so we were very much taught at an early age to vote Conservative. It, it, really? It, oh, yeah. I, I specifically remember once my class teacher, who I won't name, I was about to name, but I won't name, <laughs> uh, just walked in and said, "If there was a general election today, who would you vote for?" And 15 of us sat around, and all 15 of us said, Conservative. Sir. Uh, sir, yeah. <laughs> and at the end, he just said, well done. Crikey. It was, it was a very, very weird upbringing. How, how conscious were you of privilege? Because um, mum and dad must have paid for you to go there. Yeah, yeah. all the time. Not right. least because my very posh accent meant that other kids made fun of me. When you weren't at school. When I wasn't at school, yeah. Um, so I was, yeah, al- always aware always aware that the kids and my dad's friends looked at me with some degree of suspicion because I was very posh mm. and not very interesting. Um, so posh and, and geeky. Posh and geeky. It's the perfect combination. But you, you, you can't be unaware. It's, I mean, right. you, you'd, you'd have to be living in some sort of cognitive dissonance, you know, the ult- you'd have to experience the ultimate in cognitive dissonance, to not, and, but not least because uh, we were next to a comprehensive called Kingsdale, which at the time had a reputation of being one of the most violent comprehensives in the country. And, so, and we were literally right next to it. So I was delighted to see the other day that <laughs> Alex Yee, the triathlete, yes. uh, actually went, was a former student of Kingsdale, uh, and which means they've got one more Olympic gold medalist than I believe we have, <laughs> which I think is really nice. <laughs> but you've got the leader of UKIP. We do, yes. Yeah, so it's uh, other well, for, no, former, ref- reform. reform this week, I called, I believe. <laughs> um, and P.G. Woodhouse, I think. P.G. Woodhouse, was, Raymond Chandler, Raymond the Chandler. Chandler. Yeah. there were some amazing alumni. Um, what about, if, if privilege was a constant, what about race? What about ethnicity? It never really felt like it. Um, I, I, I can't be dishonest about this. It, I never felt that race, 
other than the enormous disappointment that my schools had that I was terrible at cricket. cricket. <laughs> uh, I, there was some expectation that I would be a mysterious leg spinner and it just didn't happen that way. I never had the talent. So still, so that that's the period where you weren't, where you were quite friendless then, the prep school years. Uh, you would be heavily engaged in your studies. I w- yeah, I was, I had friends, but they sure. weren't close and I, and... Were you conscious of that, or did you not mind particularly? Did you be a solitary content, child rather content, than a lonely child? Content to be solitary. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it must be said that I was never alone in the sense of my dad and the Bengali medical dias- diaspora that came to Britain. Mm. They formed a community uh, of which we were very much a big part, and so I was always friends with my dad's friends, children. Kid, children. Yeah. So, and that would be weekends and stuff and evenings and yeah. stuff like that. And events, it, events. Events, yeah. yeah, very much so. Religious events, cultural events. So there was always that. But I was also very happy in my own company. Mm. And by happy in my own company, things like being obsessed with cricket and football and track and field athletics and televised sport. Always Football, obviously, less so because it's so popular, but always made me feel slightly of an, of an outsider. Mm. Uh, and the you know we've just had the Olympics now, and things are I th- the thing that's changed most of all is social media. I feel because through social media, through Facebook and Twitter, um, you can find other people that are as passionate about the subjects that you are yes. quite easily. But without that, back back in the early nineteen eighties, you just kind of felt alone. Mm. Mm. Unless you could mm. join some sort of club or something, there'd yeah, exactly. be no no interaction. And then and then lo and behold, it turned out I was very good at chess. Well, quel surprise! Yes, um, I was, it was something of a high flying junior, the the under eleven level. I was in the top ten in London, and so that was taking up quite a bit of my life again. And again, a fairly a fairly friendless existence. But loving it, I mean, relishing your chess battles and your chess status. They're, they're happy days. Yeah, yeah that's what they're I said. They're not unhappy days. No. Um, I like the story about you stealing the trophy, keeping keeping the trophy. Yes, uh, potato, potato. Um, I have, I still have a trophy that was given to me um, when I won the prep school chess challenges for the third year in a row, and I still have it, and I'm not meant to have it, but I, I think they've moved on. And yeah, but, well, I hope they're. but you told your dad that you had been given it as a special reward. You were allowed to keep it because you'd won it three times. Like Brazil in 1970. Yeah. Yes, exactly that. But you just nicked it and kept it. Yep. Fantastic. Did you know you were going to be a doctor? Was it was it was it just a sort of household presumption in the mainly family? because I didn't know what else? Okay, so it wasn't enormous pressure put upon you to be one, or or, or just everyone it behaving was, as if you would be. It was it was all of that. Okay. So there was pressure, uh, there was assumptions and presumptions. There was just a feeling that it was the natural way to go, and because I was clever, nobody could see any sort of reason why this shouldn't be the case. Right. There was. But it, mu- it must be said that in the 1980s, that was the default setting of how my dad's friends, mm. who were all med- medical, saw the future of their kids. It was very much a default setting. If anyone went off that default setting at the time, th- th- there needed to be a weird reason or an explanation as to why they wouldn't want to be a doctor. Have you ever wondered what ambitions you might have formed if you hadn't been in that environment? Well, it's interesting because um, life takes you on a path where all the various decisions that you make are are basically responsible for the happiness in your life, Mm. as well as whatever unhappiness there is as well. So I know that if I took a different path, I wouldn't have any of those things. Sure. But I'm sure that I was meant to be a lawyer. Really? I think that I was good with words, good Mm. with concepts, good with remembering things, good with arguing points. Uh, just generally better at the arts than I was at the sciences. This is very much masked by the fact that I was very good at maths, but in in general I was good at English language, literature, French. Um, but that wouldn't have been a disappointment if you'd gone home and said, actually, I don't want to be a doctor. I'd quite like to be a lawyer. But it just wouldn't enter your it's not a intellectual um, orbit. It's not a um, I'm looking for a vocational degree. Right, you know, people no. who become lawyers do a degree in some something mm. that, in the eyes of Bengali parents, looks a little bit arty farty, a little bit imprecise, a bit vague. You you want to do a degree in PPE? Mm. Um, it, it's just not a Bengali thing to do. Uh, and I ended up choosing to do medicine 
because a I didn't want to disappoint my parents and mm. b I had no clever ideas. Right. I and I think one of the I have no idea now, particularly in terms of insight, what it's like now. But I think we put so much pressure on people to make these decisions very early. Mm. And I think that the Americans have a much better system where you where you, you, you go to college and discover what you're good at and use it as a springboard for the rest of your life. Mm. Whereas a medical degree is deciding at the age of 18. 16, really. Well, 16, yeah. you decide yeah. uh, what you want to be doing at the age of 50. And it, it's, there's no, it's no surprise that a lot of people drop out. Uh, and a surprising number drop out to go into comedy, actually. <laughs> slightly disproportionate, probably, in the great great scheme of things. Because to me, when I think of people like you or, 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 or Harry Hill or Mike Wozniak or, or Adam um, K, the, it's the length of the training that would make the idea of leaving it behind almost inconceivable. Because you're, you're, you're turning your back on so much yeah, and, I think and Ad- so long. I think Adam might be the exception yes. to the rule. In that I think Adam... Be- got quite a long way and had, had developed a reputation as being a very good doctor. Mm. Whereas um, I sort of stumbled into a career in general practice. Mike Wozniak, Harry Hill, I don't think they were doctors for very long. Oh, I see. You so can, they realised that the path uh, not that, taken. Interestingly, not many people know that Graham Chapman uh, course, and yeah. Graham Garden, yeah. I'm pretty sure neither of them ever practised. Right. Uh, because it was a different era. They They, they knew that they would they kind of knew they were going to be successes, right? In in the world of comedy, and and, and in a way that they, I think they were, did they both go to Cambridge? Yeah, I think, I so. think they probably because of the footlights. They probably exactly. had an experience closer to what you just said about America than they would have done. Yeah, in a, in a more so they did see other horizons opening before them and other other paths that they could go down. But we've jumped ahead back to back to early years at Dulwich Public School, the senior. The senior part of the school, I, I sense that things started changing a bit when you when you you sort of became a, a, a bit more sociable, a bit more popular. Yeah, puberty is very important, isn't it? It can be. Uh, I think puberty is when you realise a lot about who you are. But I think this is a very key thing for me: is I didn't really know the facts of life. Right. And by the facts of life, I mean with a capital F and a capital L. Right. I, I knew biologically what was what would happen, and because I was growing up gay, I didn't necessarily understand it or, yes. or find it particularly fascinating. Uh, of course, but I didn't understand my friends' jokes because I didn't really understand the world, and that's where a couple of Bengali friends of mine, about the same same age as me, they they they, they kind of took me to one side and one Christmas holidays. And just said, "This is what happens. This is this goes in there. This goes in there. This goes in there." And I'm like, "What? This is all, this is all too much for me." <laughs> but it, it was very much the turning point for me. Suddenly, all the jokes made sense. Okay. Suddenly, I, th- I think, in many ways, sex and comedy are indelibly linked. Um, if you to be a good comedian, you have to understand the motivations of human beings and the flaws of human beings. And so much of that is down to sexual, you know, how the flaws in terms of how we behave mm. are down to sexual attraction. You need to have a, an understanding of that uh, to be funny about human nature. And I think that's one of the important things that flipped. I know I was becoming more gregarious, more witty, right. uh, more popular. You enjoyed making people laugh. I enjoyed making people laugh. Not, not, a, not in a, oh, he's the life and soul of a party kind of way, but more in a sort of quietly dry a joke here, a joke there, sort of way. Verbal. Yeah. Yeah. Clever, clever. I suppose, yeah. Wordy yeah. puns and jokes. And oh, in, interestingly, one of my best friends at school uh, is, is a best selling writer himself now, Tom Standage. I don't know if you know his work. Uh, he writes for The Economist. And oh, the, yeah. Uh, okay. And um, he was the funniest person at school. <laughs> he was very much the, the life and soul of, of the wit and humour of, of, of the school. Uh, a, daz- a dazzling intellect who's, who's, who's you know, doubled down on that now and is doing incredibly well. But I, I find it interesting now that it was very much, I was very much in his shadow in many ways because he, he was the one that was coming up with funny jokes all the time. Right. Uh, and uh, But you're growing into your own skin now. Very much so, yes. And that skin is gay? Undoubtedly. You, you, <laughs> you, well, yes, but, but again, I mean, we've talked about privilege and ethnicity. That's quite a hat trick, isn't it, uh, to add sexuality to that it, it, in terms of, or it could be potentially. And the, the, I know that life is changing, society is changing, but what I found most unusual about growing up gay 
is that nobody else from my community seemed to be going through what I was going. I mm. I no one to talk to within the Bengali community. They're, even now, I look back on all the friends that I'd made. I'm still the only one. Really, I'm I'm, I'm still the only one from our particular. That's statistically unlikely. It does it? seem it does <laughs> seem unlikely. But it was just me flying the flag, and See, no, at my public school, no one was out. So it was 600 boys. There must have been. Yeah, I'm Some so, lads yeah, I'm certainly aware. It's, I mean, it's one of my friends from my my class t- came out to me many years later, right. and I would never have. No, I, of course, I just never have guessed in a million years. It was, but did I, you struggle with it? Did you struggle? I mean, were you? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, grow, growing up gay in an all boys public school is in a unique form of torture. Yes, it, of course, it's, it you're, is. You're, you're surrounded by your 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 emotions and your desires. And you're straightjacketed into knowing that you cannot act on them under any circumstances. But not only can you not act on them, you can't openly speak of them. You know, I mean, I was I was aware that some two boys before I joined had been expelled the previous year for some sort of shenanigans. Oh, really? I was aware that our headmaster had banned a production of Another Country, uh, which was meant to be the school's big play. One year, the headmaster had banned it. It was very much. An era where the school was very fragile. Yes. About the possible reputation it might give off as being a place where this sort of thing might flourish. The school was very anti that. And therefore, it was not an easy place to hold all of this in. And that's what you did. You held it all Completely, in. Completely. Until, until my last year when right. I came out to two friends from school. But it would be a while before you came out to your family. <laughs> Much longer before you Much came longer, out to your family. Much longer, yes. Dad. We'll, 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 we'll get to that. So this this sort of the inevitability of medicine is quite odd um, because it, in some ways, it, it's a, it, it, it changes your teenage years. Teenage years are supposed to be a period of discovery and new realizations. And you knew you were very clever. You you, you didn't become a, a teenage nerd. You became less nerdy, I think, as you progressed. Through. Very much so. Yes. So you, you, we mentioned that phrase, growing into your own skin. And yet, I don't want to say what's the point in developing a personality if you know what you're going to end up doing. But did it? Did you feel restricted? Did it feel like you were on rails in terms of your professional future? Well, my whole life felt like that because yeah. I, I was, I use the words cosseted and pampered and do, closeted yeah. quite yeah. a lot. That was how I felt. Right. I had conservative small C parents. Mm. Um, who wanted the best for me educationally, but I w- growing up gay meant that you 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 there are things that you're constantly holding back from, and you're yeah. not you're not you're not living your full personality because you yeah. can't be your full personality. Uh, growing up doing d- uh, subjects at A level that weren't really you meant that there was everything became much more of a struggle that that. that but there's, there, were, there were other things going on as well. This this insatiable appetite for stimulation and knowledge. It, I, I very much got caught up in my late teenage years with being obsessed with music, television. I was constantly constantly watching television. Uh, and when I say television, I'm, I'm not talking about you know Edge of Darkness or you know a, cl- a singing detective, a acclaimed drama. I used to watch everything. Duty free. Do, do, yeah, ne- never the twain. No, duty that's a great free. show, though. Um, great show. Home to roost. Home to the brush strokes. Brush strokes. <laughs> I, I mean, I used to watch a lot of. Si- I didn't realise at the time Same. what was happening. Ah. I didn't realise at the time that I was actually subliminally um, working out how comedy worked. Right. Of um, course. It, that hadn't occurred to me at the time. But looking Loads, back, but it was something of a. I mean, I, I, when people say to you, "What's your specialist subject in quiz?" I always just go the eighties, and they say, "What do you mean by that?" And I say, "Everything about all of it, it. all of it—the the news, the music, <laughs> the you know, the sick, the sitcoms, the game shows, the quiz." You're shows. inhaling, yeah, inhaling everything. Uh, and so I became very distracted from the concept of st- uh, sticking my head in books mm. uh, and learning what I was finding to be dull, boring stuff. Because your A level options had to be the ones that you needed to go to university, but Absolutely. they were not reflecting your actual enthusiasms and passions. Exactly which is that. On the front page of the Times today, uh, is two university chiefs urging the, uh, when this goes out on Friday, this will be yesterday, but as we record it on the Wednesday, it's tomorrow, urging the 
18 year olds who'd be making their decisions tomorrow to choose their degrees according to what inflames their passions rather than to what enhances their prospects and, and you, i think you're I a think case study in the in the I'm very much a case study but i'm a very old case study this is the 1980s <laughs> and you would hope that in nearly 40 years things since, might have changed since i did my a levels that things that the progress has been made and mm. certainly within my bengali community things have changed uh, one of my own personal heroes is a guy who's a few years younger than me who, t who told his parents he wanted to do a degree in drama at Bristol University. And this caused shockwaves, shockwaves to the community. This simply had never happened before. Wow. And it, it, it all turned out right for him because he was uh, president of BAFTA for two years, Krishma, <laughs> Krishma Jumda, um, who I who president, you know, he, he uh, retired as president of BAFTA last year. Wow. Uh, and with great pride, I saw his speech and I thought, I remember you when you, you were knee high, uh, telling us all you want to do a degree in drama and everybody laughing at you. Gosh. Now look at you now. And, and is there any moment yet where you thought, you know what, I'd quite like to tell jokes in public? No. no still not. Not, not. not a sniff. I was certainly fascinated by comedy. I started watching Friday Live and Saturday Live. Uh, I, when I was 17, I went to see Ben Elton at the Hammersmith Odeon. Uh, and it was, it really opened my eyes. It, right. it felt incredibly revelatory to see somebody on stage talking about politics in such an accessible way, in such, in such crisp, with mm. such crisp clarity, uh, that 17 year old me understood everything that he was saying. Um, and I was fascinated by stand up comedy, that, that whole alternative thing. The, the whole what Saturday Live and Friday Live represented and the flourishing of people like Rick Mail and Adrian Edmondson and Lenny, um, Harry Enfield. Mm. Um, it, it all felt really thrilling and countercultural counter -cultural in a way that seems quite ironic now how co mm. how cosy and mainstream so many of these figures now seem. But as, uh, growing up, it was very much what excited me. And when I went to medical school, I was in tooting. Yeah. Uh, St George's and A St George's was the recent home of Harry Hill so he he left to become a doctor the year that I joined but we were two stops down from the Banana Cabaret in Balham and it was very much me that led the sort of exodus of students on a Friday or Saturday night to go to the Banana Cabaret and watch stand-up comedy and we used to have comedians coming to the med school as well and <sighs> It just always felt like my favourite art form, right. stand-up. There was a purity to it. Uh, 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 you know, there's so much talk now about freedom of expression and whether comedians truly have freedom of expression. I think we do, and it really rankles with mm. me when people say that we don't. I, I honestly believe that we do, obviously within certain limitations in broadcast medium, but I feel that when you're on stage in a comedy club, you, you, can, do what, you can do whatever you like. You, you have to justify it mm. Mm. Art artistically. And it felt like that in the 1990s as well. It just felt this freedom of expression and free, stylistic freedom. So, I, I mean, I remember the first time I saw Alan Davis. I, I couldn't quite believe how good it was. Uh, it, it left, uh, he spent five minutes talking about the bad decor on the ceilings. Five, uh, just five minutes on that. And I was sat, sat there going, this is incredible. And I was very much lucky to see a generation of comedians that become very much ensconced in, in mainstream living rooms, such as Alan Davis and Harry Hill and, yes. and Phil Jupiter and Mark, Mark Lamar and that that gen and Bill Bailey, of course, the yeah. beloved Bill Bailey of uh, Strictly fame. Um, the idea back then that these people could be television superstars seemed ludicrous because they they were lot they they were swaggering. Live comedy, le you know, live comedy legends. They weren't. They weren't meant to be. For, they didn't feel like they were meant to be for television. It was still the era of game show hosts, wasn't it? The comedians, exactly. Would be, yeah, you know, the, the shiny face, shiny TV. So I, so I feel like I was lucky enough to have an amazing comedic education because of geography as much as anything. Because else. of geography and. But we, still, a hundred percent consumer as opposed to fr oh, yeah. frustrated performer or I mean, participant. I, I, I wrote for the review, the medical school review, something that Harry Hill did as well, uh, and indeed Mike Wozniak. Mm. Um, and I sometimes performed, but I was very much aware that I was a better writer 
than I am an actor. I mean, I'm still a terrible actor. But, uh, this this voice that you hear uh, is my one voice. Uh, and uh, it never know, held Sean Connery back, did it? <laughs> no. Uh, but I was very much, a, you know, a, a creative now. Yes. I was writing songs, you know, writing sketches, writing, writing jokes. Uh, but it still never occurred to me to be a performer. And it never occurred to you to try to be a writer either. I mean, you were a doctor. Oh, yeah. Going to be I was a doctor. a doctor with an interest in making people laugh. Yes. That's that's how I describe myself, um, be it toilet graffiti or the, <laughs> or the, or the, or the, the gossip. There, there was a particular toilet in the men's toilets in the library that became like a shrine to joke writing. And, right. no, no, and, and it, it was it was like nerdy graffiti, really, because no, nobody would put their name to anything but people had to try and work out from the handwriting whose joke that might be um uh, but I, I edited the gossip mag which is a very probably doesn't sound like much now but probably the one most prized job at the med school was editing the gossip mag uh, and me and my mate duncan edited it for a year and the surge in both popularity and, and unpopularity that, uh, that that came with that was 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 a, my my first sort of um, experience of the adrenaline rush of people finding you funny. Okay. The and uh, attention and, and and attention and at a time what an experience that I just growing up I just never had. I was never someone that was talked about or in 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 hushed reverential tones. And suddenly I'm someone that everybody knows at med school. And it felt amazing. Did it? And and you were mature enough to note what was happening. You were mature enough to realise that was happening. I think in retrospect, for sure. Well, I know in retrospect, because that's um, what I'm wondering if at the time you were you were uh, registering there, these. I think there was a cruelty to the slag mag. That, sorry, I call it the slag mag. That's the nickname for the magazine. Yeah. There was a cruelty to it that I was prepared to ignore in, in the pursuit of popularity. Oh, gosh, that's interesting. But certainly. Uh, and and that you know when I say that uh, it brought me popularity and unpopularity, that was very much the case. Mm. But the popularity was overwhelmingly more statistically <laughs> significant <laughs> than the unpopularity. So when does the impulse bite then? As you approach your final year at St George's, you're you're, you're heading off to be a, a, a doctor under supervision in hospitals. Mm. When, when does this first? Because from what we've heard so far, it, it's, it's it's obviously not coming out of nowhere, but it is quite unexpected. Oh, go on then. I'll, I'll, why don't I get up on stage and have a go myself? Yeah, it was the it was the nineteen ninety four was the year. Mm. I failed my finals. This is not a surprise. It's not even a big story, really. I'd failed so many of my exams. It was devastating at the time, but I knew that if I just put my head down and yeah. worked hard enough for the resets, I'd probably pass. Uh, and that six months, um, I went to watch a lot of comedy with my sister, who's a big comedy fan. Uh, and we went, we went to a place called the Cosmic Comedy Club uh, in Hammersmith, now a block of flats, sadly. It was um, a Tuesday night, open mic night. And I saw some people that went on to be very famous there, like Johnny Vegas and Lee Mack, I first saw really? at the open, open spot night at the Cosmic. And I also saw a lot of rubbish as yeah. well. Uh, and eventually... This 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 nagging thought comes into your head, which is, oh, I should give this a go. Now, I must stress now, because it's a very different world now where people go in with uh, ambition yeah. and a plan, that London's open spot scene was so busy and so packed with gigs, it was perfectly okay to just give it a go. The idea that you had to rush it, you know, rush your journey or have big ambitions to be a professional stand-up comedian was not the open spot scene that I recognised from 1995. I thought, for a start, I was 25 and I was young. Mm. At 25, I felt young. But I thought I'd be unusual in doing it for for shits and giggles rather than anything more more um, profound than that. I wasn't. There was a lot of us around. There was a lot of us for whom this was clearly the, akin to bungee jumping. Or, or, <laughs> or, or the, a lot of people that I look back with a lot of fondness and affection who quite clearly knew they were never going to be stand-up comedians professionally. 
Uh, and I was one of them. All, I, all of which means you're not feeling under enormous pressure when you finally No, decide. not at all. Yeah. Uh, and I look back on that time, I, th- I think I said this in the book, that if I'd died three times in a row, mm. I'd have probably given up. But it always kind of went death, death, good, death, good, death, death, good, like that. And sometimes two or three good ones in a row, who mm. knows? Uh, it's a long time ago now. I was always doing just enough to keep to come keep, back next time, me in. because I wasn't I, and I wasn't in London for most of this. I was a junior doctor in Kings Lynn, and I've got to say that when I was a junior doctor in Kings Lynn, everybody found it fascinating. It was a real oh, have you met Paul? He he does stand up. Okay. They, they didn't need to know that I wasn't getting paid f- for any of it. No, but it was it became part of your identity. Then. Very much, and and it helped me on my CV. And, and you liked it. You yeah. liked that part of your identity. Yeah, exactly. But there's no sense yet of it being the path out of the stethoscope. No, nor did I necessarily think that there would ever be a path mm. out of the steth- stethoscope. Um, so when did that happen? When did so? Because you did both, didn't you? So you must well, have been getting better and better. You, like the comedy store, you, you chalked that off relatively quickly. I uh, got an agent, um, started taking things more seriously. Ninety nine, new actor of the year, came third at the Hackney Empire. Behind the great Daniel Kitson in second, and a guy called Anton, who is a who went back to la- being a, a labourer in Liverpool. Really, he, he didn't like being a stand-up. That's a story. Yeah, I, I don't Isn't know what's it? happened to him now. That's a, to beat you and Daniel Kitson, and then go back to that. I mean, that's a fascinating story. I'd love to. I'd love right. to meet Anton. So he would I. Now so, I've never heard of him before. So funny. <laughs> Such a funny guy. Um, but but so so there's two plates spinning, but still no sense that one plate is going to take over from the other plate. Nor did I think there was ne- it was necessarily going to happen because I became mm. a locum GP. As soon as, as soon as I qualified as a GP, yeah. I became a locum. That enabled me to have a, a, um, a timetable yeah. that I could mould around the, the comedy first and the medicine second. Um, and that's how I sort of lolloped along for quite a while. My agent was a, a nice man, John Keyes, but not an especially ambitious agent. He mm. was... His speciality was getting overseas comics spots at the Glee and the Comedy Store and Jonglers and filling in their diaries. Right. I was very much not his speciality. That's no. not to insult him at all. He was a good agent, but he wasn't, and in many ways, the perfect agent for me. Yes. Because he wasn't necessarily bothered about what I wanted to do. As he long would, as, as yeah, long as he wouldn't he could, be frustrated by the yeah. fact that you weren't constantly available. Or, exactly. Or, okay. Uh, and so he was, he was the perfect agent for me. And... I'm lolloping along, and and then lolloping becomes something more fun as the gigs get better, and you start doing gigs overseas. Mm. I did three weeks of gigs in South Africa in 2003, another a gig in front of 4,000 people in Johannesburg in 2005. Started doing the Middle East gigs, which is an interesting story in itself because I can't just you know it's, it's one part of my life I can't justify. I can't really justify standing on stage in Dubai and Doha and Abu Dhabi talk, talking openly about being gay, but knowing full well that if I wasn't a Westerner, I'd, I'd be possibly thrown in prison for the same view, viewpoints. Looking back on it, I can't justify that, that pinkwashing side of, of my career. Um, it, it came up um, during the World Cup in Doha mm. when it, Joe, Joe Lice it very... Um, very uh, brazenly yes. criticised David Beckham, and then people said, "But well, you've worked in the Middle East, and I think you have to own it and go, yeah, yeah I did, and and I'm, I'm not proud of it. And luckily, I didn't do it for the money. It, the money wasn't that great. Was it not? I did it for the buffets. The buffets. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> um, and, and so the, 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 the momentum is building constantly. You're freed from some of the conditions that other comics suffer from, as in fear, of of not being able to pay the bills or fear of because yeah that's an interesting point you make and it's true it you know I was also I was making a not an amazing living sure. as a GP but no. a, de- a decent living as a GP uh, and it did it did mean that I could take a show to the Edinburgh Festival in two thousand and four where I fundamentally lost a lot of money mm. because nobody came to see it which can be existential for some comics exactly it? whereas for you you've got your Day job, as it were. Yeah, you know, I, I funded it through the day. You know, yeah. I funded my month through the day job. Uh, but it taught me a lot about how the Edinburgh Festival actually worked, because I was very, very naive. I thought I could just turn up, 
pretty much and, and wing it. Did you? Uh, and it, because it's a longer set than you would do in the clubs. It was or, a very different set. It was about my hatred of the film Love Actually. This was aspects of Love Actually. Yeah, that was your two thousand and four show. Yeah, and I thought there'd be enough interest in such a quirky subject. Yeah, that people would, there was no interest at all because the discussion about whether Love Actually is a good film or not has t- started taking place ten to fi- ten to fifteen years after my show. So you were very ahead of the time, but that's um, no consolation to two thousand and four. Because Paul. enough people have to have watched it for it to become a substantive debating point yes and back in 2004 not enough people had watched it for people to, to care enough for the engagement that you needed for the show to exactly. work I, I, I didn't i didn't work things out well but i learned a lot i learned a lot by hanging around with better comics i learned a lot about getting a show into some kind of shape over the course of the month okay um and the discipline that was needed to do it better next time so much so that two years later you're nominated for for, for best show with 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 Saint Saint or Sinner. Yes, and one of the big differences was PR. Right. Um, even now, when I watch the Edinburgh Festival from a distance, so I'm not there this year. Mm. I I know who's got PR. I know you can tell. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I I can tell who's got what. Almost tell who's got which PR person. Wow. Uh, because it's it's such a major influence. It's it's rarely discussed. Because people think that you have to have a big agent to, to go to Edinburgh. You don't need a big agent. You need a big PR person. A really good, connected PR person. That goes in and tells you. Tireless. Who likes your show. Yeah, who, yeah, who is there. Because I remember dealing with PRs. In fact, some of the ones that you're probably thinking of now. And you could tell if they had passion for the act, that was worth its yeah. weight in gold. I, I, more than anything else, actually. And, and interestingly, in 2004... I made no play of being uh, an openly gay British Asian doctor. Mm. In 2006, I went in whistles and bells. Oh, because it makes you stand out. It makes you a story. Yeah. That's a story uh, before you've even walked onto the stage. Um, and, and, and now uh, we sort of reach the parts of your life where you become more and more known. I suppose there's three significant milestones in, 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 in the journey from there to now. One of which is the quizzing. The, the, after a humiliation on University Challenge, the professionals, you became... Uh, yeah, I, I call it humiliation, and yet history suggests it was just a defeat. Yes, okay. <laughs> if, okay, But not if, something that you could comfortably accept. No. Given your self-image. No, I, I mean, it, I must stress I was always into quizzes. I was, I, I'd reached a, a, a sort of quasi-legendary status at medical school mm. for being the guy that could clean out the quiz machine. In, in, oh, I used of, to love those machines. One, one of my friends told me the other day that she she, she, um, she said, uh, we used to go to the pub and every time anyone ran out of money, they said, Paul, go, go Paul, on the go, quiz machine. Go on the machine and get us around, will you? That's and that's apparently, that's what I, you, apparently that's what I used to do. Um, I was always into quizzes and I always wanted to be good at quizzes. And when the opportunity came to appear on University Challenge Challenge Mm. Professionals, I thought we were going to at least win an episode because we we had Natalie Haynes, the the best-selling classics author, and Simon Evans, you know, a man whose political views uh, don't have an iota of Venn diagram intersection with me, but is an unbelievably clever man with with a back, you know, very well read, very literate, uh, very literate with a degree in law. Uh, and so we thought we were going to win, and we got battered by a, by a team from the Ministry of Justice, <laughs> who it turned out their captain was. I, I read the words used of him in, a, in another book about quiz, one of the most significant figures in the history of academic buzzer quizzing. That was that was their captain, Rob Linham, who's now a very good friend of mine. Uh, so we'd been ambushed. We didn't know. We thought we were, we were going to win course, our episode, yeah. but we'd be absolutely ambushed. And that whole day of being surrounded by smug, more intelligent people, <laughs> it just it fired something. In me. It just it just it was the, it was the absolute realization. I want to beat these people one day. So you went home and signed up for Mastermind. Yep, and that didn't go well. <laughs> and <laughs> but, but but you were on a journey, Paul. Now. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it was very much an essential part of the journey. So when you did things like Eggheads and Brain of Britain, were you doing that as a civilian? Or were yes. They, so so yeah, you didn't I, go on as a celebrity? On no, 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 this is before I was on the chase. Yes, but you got better and better to the point where you get approached by ITV. When did you actually knock the medicine on the head completely? 
Uh, sort of late late noughties. Okay. Uh, and that was very much my my agent pointing out to me that if I wanted to achieve my ambitions, I had to be available. What were your ambitions at this point? I don't know. Okay, but I've but, never but, truly but not that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I've, this. I've never truly known. So um, so this is this is twenty ten twenty eleven that yeah. the, the, the process starts and that. So you know you're 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 top tier comic, but you're not a household name. Not at all. No. Um, and then. Oddly, you achieve household name status not not through comedy. Strange, yes. Uh, the cinnamon for people who uh, yeah. haven't worked it, it out it, by it, now. It, it's strange, and I'm very proud of the fact that there's no real connection. No, I'm, I'm a genuine polymath. Yes, I'm, I'm very good at two different things. Yeah, no, no one expects you to tell jokes when you come out on the. I mean, it's good. And, and, you're all quite witty by nature, but it's not. You're not there for your gag telling. Skills. No, I'm there for my. Well, quizzic, and the fact that they knew that I wouldn't collapse un- under the cameras, which, yeah, which really, really helped. Yes, of course. In terms of getting the job, but it's you know I I earned the right to be on the show through my own hard work. Uh, I you know Mark Mark who is you know the the legend the beast. Yeah. I'd beaten him in the World Championships the year in two thousand and nine, and I'd beaten Anne in the World Championships in two thousand and ten, which I mentioned on my application it's because the, the, you know I wasn't a lot of people. As as is the way, really. Whenever anyone sees anyone they've not necessarily heard of, who's from a minority group, thought that there might be a bit of diversity box ticking to the selection, mm. but th- th- nothing, nothing of the sort. Well, they can't be, can they? Because it would cost them a fortune. Exactly. But yeah. you have to be the, be the 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 people most likely to prevent the members of the public from winning the money. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I don't think any of us would claim that we're the the five or six best quizzes in the country. Because you need to not collapse in front of the camera, and you yeah. have to have a bit of charisma and. There's a reason why, but we all, with the greatest of respect, there's a reason why the eggheads, some of the eggheads, haven't transferred onto the true. chase. And <laughs> and and I mean, eggheads is very interesting in that sense because within that team, there's two or three people who possibly have known more facts than any other human being that's ever, ever lived. Yeah, ever, yeah. Um, and uh, but yeah, I don't think they'd have necessarily made chases dry, dry and lovely people as they are. So they're they're. they're People reading the book will 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 discover things about you that we we're not going to have time to talk about, including your gambling addiction, which you you write about very, um, uh, very openly, very honestly, and 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 yet ultimately very unremarkably, and that one day you just weren't addicted to gambling anymore. I think it's similar to the being bored when I was a kid. Yes, I think I've always had an ironically, given the later news, I've always had a need for a dopamine hit. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and, and that gave you that. And and um, when when I got into quizzing, and when I realised that, that when I when I realised that the internet was my friend, and not just and not just not just my enemy, that right. the internet could make my life spectacularly better as a professional quizzer. Yes. I didn't need gambling. The number of times I, w- I was sat at home going, I'm bored. Right. And I'd wander down to the bookmakers, and I'd spend three or four hours there throwing throwing my wages away on various horses and greyhounds, just became something that I didn't want to do anymore. Mm. It helped, I think, that once I was on the chase, I was occasionally recognised in the bookies, and the discomfort of that certainly helped my my uh, drift, my drift away from yeah. the betting shop. But it wasn't therapy. But it was a drift. It wasn't a yeah. guest out switch or anything. It, it wasn't uh, therapy. It wasn't um, you know ad- addiction counselling. Uh, not that I'm... Criticizing that, though. no, of course, I, I, I absolutely recommend that for just anyone who's throwing the, their life yeah. away. It just kind of happened. Um, and and then you mentioned the, the the what followed, which is the the Parkinson's diagnosis, um, which I, I think you started presenting symptoms in 2017, and and the the diagnosis came in 2019, just after your 49th birthday. You've called it a relief. Yes, the diagnosis. It was a relief because I, by this stage I'd read about the the, the bigger ones. They mm. feel like bigger ones: multiple sclerosis, yeah. motor neurone disease. Um, they feel like more rapid descents. Whereas with Parkinson's, it feels like although everybody's different and everybody's you know timeline is different, it feels like a steadier process rather than a process of su- surprises and shocks. Okay. Uh, and so when I realised that I simply had to be having something neurological going on, it was it was a relief. The first mm. two weeks was uh, the, com- the coming out process to, to loved ones was the toughest part. 
But coming out to society, I can't tell you the degree to which the weight came off the shoulders very, very quickly. There was a, 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 a mad rush of online love mm. that really helped. And then life then moves on after that. And it's, you know, having agency, trying to own what's going on. It, these are really important things. Having a sense that your decision making is part of your decision making as to how you go about the, the illness and is has significance. Yes. Really, really helps your psychological management. Does the medical training make it better or worse? Well, for me, it didn't make any difference at all because whenever I've been a patient, I've always decided to, to step back to point zero okay. so that nothing that the doctor says uh, I've, I assumed I'd know already. So for me, but it's different for different people, I imagine. Um, I'm also aware that so many of my medical friends saw me and never guessed. In that period between the first presentation of the frozen shoulder and the diagnosis nearly 18 months later, loads loads of my friends could have told me, but they just didn't see it. They, right. they, so it presented in a slightly unusual fashion. Um, so no blame attached to anyone. No, of course. Just one of, the, just one of those things. I suppose you've got to entertain the thought in order to arrive at the conclusion, haven't yeah. you? And if you haven't entertained the thought, you may interest. Miss. I mean, interestingly, about two months before... Two, about two months before the diagnosis, a random tweet said, "This is how my this is how my husband's Parkinson started, or, or something like that." Gosh. And I chose to ignore it because I thought, "What? A, what, a thought, what a, an abruptly rude tweet that was." But it was actually quite yeah thoughtful in a way. Exactly. Yeah. Potentially, there, there was there's a Taskmaster episode, isn't there, which knits quite a lot of these themes together. When I mean, you you kind of I think they use it now. You've said in. Um, medical schools. Yeah, your my, series, not an episode, a whole series of Taskmaster. Where yeah, the, the my my agent said she'd been asked permission from medical schools uh, <laughs> to use my, and certainly the consultant that first diagnosed me. The second time he, I went to see him, he said, "I've just been watching you on Taskmaster. I wish I'd known. I'd have, I, I'd have diagnosed you far quicker." Oh wow! Um, because the tasks were too much for you. Yeah. Uh, but there were there were telltale signs right. in the in the way that I adju adjust and, and move uh, that he said were absolutely diagnostic. So we arrive at today now. Uh, you, you you are still all of the things that you uh, have described yourself as where where we began. You're, you're still a, well, you're not you're no longer a relatively dull and studious Asian kid. I'm still studious. Yeah, exactly. But, but not, I don't think I'm dull. dull. No, uh, but and and you were pushed into a career in medicine, but in some ways you fell out of it again, and ended up as a professional stand-up comedian. Perhaps most unexpectedly, television star via the quizzing rather than the <laughs> rather than the comedy, um, uh, uh, and still the o first openly gay. The only openly gay British Asian qualified doctor and TV quizzer on the UK comedy circuit. I'm confident that's an accolade that is never going to be. Unless Ramesh Ranganathan has been keeping some secrets it, from us. Yeah, several, actually. Um, how, how much of. You never seem to have had much of a plan, Paul. I, 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 no. As you, you know, you mentioned Alistair at the beginning. I do know some comedians socially, some very good friends of mine are comedians. The word plan has a weight in com conversations between comedians that other people probably don't appreciate. Sometimes it's almost spat, the word, the, the, the ones with a plan. Now, it, it, not always, but you never really had a plan. And yet, the diagnosis must have, in some way, influenced whatever unwritten plans you might have had. I don't think I even had unwritten plans. No. That's, the that's weird what I thing said, yeah. That's the weird thing about my life, is that none of it was planned. I never really wanted to be a doctor. I, so the, the idea of being a professional quizzer was unheard. But did, the job didn't exist when I was growing up. And the idea that me, uh, a man with no acting skills, a man who does not consider himself to be naturally effervescently funny, but somebody who writes good jokes, uh, could make a career as a stand-up comedian, it, 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 never, it never occurred to me. I now am in a situation where nearly all my gigs are headline spots yeah. and, and even tough gigs i can i can take them on confident in the knowledge that i'll probably do really well at this gig and that status as a comedian it's bewil it's bewilderingly unlikely <laughs> but i've just stuck at it i've just hung on in there 
and perhaps the fact that I know I don't want you know I, the last thing I want to do is is go back to medicine has <laughs> is, 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 is been has been the the driving force I don't know but it's it's been a full it's been a full roller coaster adventure but with no defining ambitions and I don't knock people for having ambition sure there's there's more than one way to skin a cat and having ambitions and having a plan that's fine as well of course but i was just aware when i think back to that era of open spot comedians that i was part of in the night in the mid 1990s none of us seemed to none of us seemed to have a plan and perhaps the ones that did are the ones that got really successful i think of people like mickey flanagan and mm. Jeannie yashere who were both op- and who were both open spots at the same time same time as me i i, I you know, I, I remember driving Romesh Ranganathan to a gig where he was in 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 um, where was it Leicester, mm. an, an Asian comedy night in Leicester, where I was headlining and he was in the middle. And I said to him on the way back, "You're one of the best newer comics I've ever seen." And he went, "Thank you very much." And I was like, "I had no idea he was going to he was going to yeah. become a, a national treasure within a very short space of time." I've watched people co- I've watched people zoom right past me, and that's absolutely fine because that's not that's not the path. That, that I, you wanted. That I, that's not the path I wanted. I just wanted to be a comedian, and luckily, I'm a I'm a TV person now, thanks to taking a chance on the whole general knowledge thing. But as for comedian, I just wanted to make people laugh. I just wanted to be that person at a dinner party that was more interesting than the next person because they make people laugh for a living. And you've done this stuff, yeah. So that almost answers. Well, that does answer what was. What, the next question, which was going to be, is, is are there any boxes unticked? But you never had any boxes in the first place, did you? Is, is there, uh, but are there things you would, you do think sometimes I'd quite like to do that? I'd, I'd love to be a journalist at an Olympic Games. I was watching the. Pa- I meant oh, things oh. within the realms of possibility. <laughs> in terms of, well, it's not impossible, is no. it? No. Um, but uh, but I, not I, in I, terms of comedy. I'd you? like to write about sport in a more considered way at, at, at some level. Okay. There's nothing um, to stop you. And um, other than that, I went to Brazil for the first time this year, and that was the big one. I, given all I'd written about uh, pink washing in yeah. um, in the book, I wasn't going to go to Brazil until Bolsonaro was out. Right. So we waited. Me and Oliver, I had my husband. We waited. And we waited. And once Bolsonaro went, it was time to go to Brazil, and it felt like a bucket list trip. It, uh, the the whole thing, and it's interesting because I've got some time off possibly in January, and I don't know what to do with it because there's mm. nothing left on my there's there's there isn't anything in particular on my bucket list. Personally so, or professionally? Personally or professionally, I no. It's a nice position to be in. I, I, but an odd one. I mean, any any, any progress you make comes with concurrent yeah. uh, anxieties. I, I in the New Zealand Comedy Festival in 2019, I played my biggest solo audience of 700. It was an it was a show, an extra show added on because all my other shows were selling so well. Was the chase is so massive in New Zealand? Right. And all I got for that was th- two weeks of complete stress about ticket sales and the sex extra gig that we put on. So <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do, you're never tr- you're never truly happy. Never truly free. You ne- yeah, you're never truly free. Every, every every bit of progress brings another set of anxieties. In many uh, ways, your sanguine nature equips you for that better than better than if you were a more excitable character, doesn't it? Well, I think that the w- one thing <laughs> I will say when people say, "Did you was your medicine a waste?" is it gave me a very good platform in terms of perspective. Mm. I don't talk a lot about my medical career, but I saw some stuff and, and you know, I've, sk- I've skimmed over it in the book. But, you know, I've seen real death. Uh, God, and yeah. and yeah. death and, dis- you know, as an accident emergency doctor, dismemberment as well. And it just makes you realise that having a bad 20 minutes on stage at a comedy gig is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Life moves on. I've got some vivid descriptions, some truly awful twenty minutes yeah. in in the book, and life. Just, you know, they're anecdotes now. They they they, they harden you. Final question: What what what? And of course, you do talk about this in the book as well. But what what what? Have, what's your dad made of it all? He's quietly proud. <laughs> He's been on an incredible journey. I mean, my mum's been on a, perhaps a, a, a bigger journey because you know she people you know in Ben. In Bengali society, dad, it's it's still quite patri, you of know, course, it's quite yeah. patriarchal. Uh, but they've both been on an unbelievable journey, and you know, the climax of the book is is the culmination of that journey, uh, an, an event that I never imagined in a million years could possibly happen to me and be 
a hundred percent positive. Um, and I love them to bits for the progress that they made, for how much they love my husband. I mean, they really, really, really love my husband. Uh, and I, I talk about my autistic nephew as well um, in the book, and they've had to deal with that. This is all new to them mm. as, as well. So they, they, they've been on a journey that they never thought they would be taking when they first arrived here in 1968. And so this book is very much a tribute to their journey as well. And I think uh, you know, it feels even more important now when people are uh, slandering economic migration to say that I'm goddamn proud that my parents chose to make that to come here for no other reason than to make their life financially better. That's why they that's why they came here and that's why they stuck at it. And they've given and they've given and they've given and they've given to society in this country. And I'm proud of the journey they made. And they're proud of you. One Sinner Lifetime by Paul Sinner is out now. Comedy, Disaster and One Man's Quest for Happiness, which I think we've established in the course of the last hour, has been a largely successful quest. A roller coaster, yeah, large, largely successful is a good description. Paul Sinner, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>